Hey, how's it going, everybody? It's the last RRE. We're going to talk about the ultrasound and the pelvis. And before I continue, I just want to say one last thing. Next year, when you guys see Kenny in the hallway, make sure you let him know. Make sure you say thanks because he's been putting a lot of time for these videos. You know, say thank you. And then let him know he looks beautiful because he's been putting a lot of work at the gym. And I don't think you guys appreciate it. <laughs> so, so if you guys see him, just let him know he looks beautiful. And I don't want to hear no, oh, it's struck. I can. It's going to be awkward. I don't care. Okay. You, you find it in your heart to let this man know he looks beautiful. Okay. We're never going back to school, Ishrock. We're getting that. No, man. They need to know, Kenny. They need to appreciate. All right. With that being said, let's continue. Ultrasound used in the pelvis. Okay. So, first trimester. Most of the time you're going to use ultrasound is only to rule out, for the most part, ectopic pregnancies, okay? Uh, with pregnant females, first trimester, that's mostly what you're looking for. And that's pretty much where ultrasound in the pelvic region with females and childbearing age comes in most in handy. It's all about topic pregnancy. Okay, but in third trimester, you can use it to diagnose placental previa and placental abruption along with ovarian cysts and other things, but it's mainly about ectopic pregnancy. Okay, so normal anatomy, right? The uterus is gonna be between the bladder rectum and the ovaries is going to be surrounded by these things. So it's, I'll show that to you. And then on the ovaries, just know that the cortex has all the follicle on both sites and the medulla has the vasculature. And the position can vary during pregnancy. Like the ovaries can shift the position. So this is the ovaries. And just know that anteriorly it has the broad ligament. And also the external and iliac external and internal iliacs they kind of like cross the ovary so external iliacs are more anterior and then internal iliacs are posterior to the ovaries and you can kind of use that to see that if it's really the ovaries so once again as you can see here the internal external iliacs i'm sorry are go anterior to the ovaries let's see if that's everything right yep okay all right, so transabdominal scanning, as you know in RE we talked about today, that you can scan the uterus in two ways. You can do the transvaginal or the transabdominal. Transabdominal, uh, you have a bigger field of view. Transvaginal, better resolution. So planes in transabdominal, you, this is your how you would place the transducer for a sagittal view. As you can see, in a sagittal view, um, you can see the uterus here with the fundus and then you can correlate with this image right here it's the same thing so you see the bladder and then you see superior and inferior to that in this image or superior and posterior to that is the uterus and then this is called where the arrows are uh, that wait, that's the endometrial lining so another thing is the endometrius comes out very echogenic, hyperechoic compared to the myometrium. Myometrium is more hypoechoic. Endometrium is relatively hyperechoic. Can you work good? Yes? Yep. All right. Okay, and then this is a this is a transabdominal transabdominal view of a ovary on a sagittal view. So the external iliacs, they go anterior to the ovaries and kind of adjacent. So this is more of like an adjacent view. Superior to that, the iliac vessels, the external iliac vessels are on top and then they kind of cross anterior and lateral to the ovaries. All right, okay. And then this is a transducer placement for a trans abdominal transverse view. And the way you can tell the difference is on a transverse view, you might be able to see the uterus and the ovaries right and left. And as you see, the bladder's obviously anterior. This is 
where your signal is coming through. So the bladder's anterior correlated with this picture. And then on this view, you can see the right and left ovaries right next to each other. On a sagittal, you can't really see in one plane the ovary and the uterus really. Okay, so transvaginal scanning, uh, you can so like as he said earlier today um, during RRE, you place the transducer until you can see the bladder, and then as you see, so this is a this is going to be a sagittal scanning view, and then you turn it for the. It's actually technically a coronal view, but I'll go more into that. And you'll see. So this is a sagittal view. It's cutting the uterus in a right to left plane, and. Kenny, so what is what are these arrows showing? Like I said, endometrial lining. Yeah, and what does F stand for? Don't look at the bottom. This, this right here. <laughs> Cervix. What do you think this is? Uh, anus. Right, and what is this place called? That's the vagina, I assume. The vagina would be like actually that's where the transducer is. So remember uh, how they said. Uh, yeah, so right. this is like this is this is the rectum, this is the uterus and cervix, and the uh -huh. space between would be what? That's the retro uterine pouch. Yeah, it's very right. clinically important. Yeah, you're right. And then the so the I think he showed a picture. So because it bends, it's kind of it's like a mind trick type thing. It really messes your mind, but the vagina is actually up here and then it kind of curves. Uh -huh. Yeah. So because yeah. the transducers here, so it's like here. But this uh -huh. is the rectal uterine pouch. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, and then there's a video. I'll show that in a second. Okay. And then here, this is the same image. So in the remember how I said in the rectal uterine pouch, sometimes you can see bowels too. So that's what this is. That, that space is usually taken up by bowels. And then it's the rectum more posterior okay. to that. Make sense? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And then, so, and then what is the lighter part again? In the mutual lining. Yeah, that part gets thicker mm -hmm. from secretory to proliferative phase. Isn't it proliferatory to secretory? Proliferatory to secretory, yeah, sorry. So it's at that point, it's going to be like really thick and it's going to be mostly hyperchoid in that area. Uh -huh. From that, remembering from that strip. So it uh -huh. varies. Okay, and then this is gonna be your coronal view. You just trans, you just turn the transducer to the right 90 degrees, and it gives you this image. And so, in this image, as you can see, uh, this picture is showing you right here how it cuts the uterus. So you only see just uh, you don't see the uterus in a long long axis and you don't see the endometrial lining in long axis you just get like a transverse oh. cut of it so sometimes that's okay. why they call this also a transverse image technically it's a coronal but it's like as you can see it can kind of be a transverse cut of the uterus uh -huh. you get what i'm saying and okay. on this view you, you'll see the once again the ovaries to the right and left to do that you just have to kind of turn the transducer more laterally each side to get view of each and for the uterus here how you scan it as you see how the uterus is right so what you do is you fan you fan this like up and down like this and that's how you scan like through the uterus you get what i'm saying yeah um, uh -huh. talk to me are you confused yeah you good? Yeah, no, it just took me a while to <laughs> okay. took me a while to register that. Okay, good. Okay, so this is a video of them doing the transvaginal coronal scanning. They're fanning the they're going up and down with it, and as you can see, they're going from the fundus to the cervix. So they're going from more to anterior to posterior. Does that make sense, Kenny? They're going from the fundus to the cervix, you said? Yeah, it can because you can see it, it's getting smaller because the fundus is more dilated, right? The cervix is narrow. So let me bring you back to the other picture. Like so. So you see this, right? 
they're they're moving this up from here down this way. Uh, like a like an mm -hmm. a kind of like this. Get what I'm saying? Oh uh, wait, what? <laughs> so this is the yeah, transistor, yeah. right? You can see my video, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's going like heavy. from here. So it's a coronal view, and it's going like this. So it's going. Yeah. Like, and it's mm -hmm. cutting it, getting the different slices, and to get the view of the ovaries, they would have to go a little bit laterally and do the same thing, or for each of uh -huh. them. Got it? Yeah. All right. Cool. All right, we did that. Okay, so these are some of the normal findings. All right, so Kenny, walk me through this. All right, so this is so the embryo it implants right into the endometrial lining, right? And it has a trope, it's surrounded by tropoblast, right? And the tropoblast ends up becoming the chorionic membrane. Am I right? I don't know. I think so. Okay, so it implants here. And so what's happening is, you can see me, right? It implants yeah. and then it, it becomes, it creates the decidua micellus and then a sac forms. So you still have the chorionic membrane. And then on the other side, you have the other portion of the endometrial lining, the opposite wall, right? So it's only implants on one side, right? It implants on one side and then it starts growing. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. It starts growing. So it, ha it already has a chorionic membrane, but until it touches the other wall, there's gonna be a little right. bit of space in the other wall. Okay, so as you can see, it implants here, right? And then this is the chorionic membrane. And then it's, it's gonna be, uh, which is on this side, the side toward the endometrial cavity is called decidua capillaris. And the side that's implanted into the endometrium is decidua bacillus. So this is, this is gonna keep growing, right? Mm -hmm. And then you yeah. have this wall right here on the other side of the endometrium, right? Mm -hmm. the opposite side. The opposite side is called decidua paratellus. You get what I'm saying so far? Uh -huh. So this implants, right? This implants, wherever it implants, that's decidua bacillus, right? Got that, cool? Uh -huh. And then- I thought the decidua bacillus was part of the endometrium. Yeah, the part that's, that it's connected once it, it implants, the part that there, it's in conjunction with the endometrium is decidua bacillus, right? Okay, yeah. And then, then you have the part that's not embedded, right? Only one side of it embedded. <laughs> The other side yeah. is on the endometrial cavity, right? Mm -hmm. That portion is called the decidua capillaris. And then uh, you have the cavity, and then on the other side, you have the other side of the endometrial wall, right? Yeah. And that's the decidua paratellus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gotcha. Got it? Okay, so now, this is, these are some of the normal things. So a female comes in pretty young, uh, young into the pregnancy. We're looking for an ectopic pregnancy. We're gonna be looking, depending on what time of the pregnancy she's in, what if she has these normal signs of fetal growth into the interuterus. If she does have that, that rules out ectopic pregnancy. So one of this is called the double decisional sign, which is basically what I explained. So this side, right? Can you see this? This side is decidua bacillus, right here. It's implanted there, and this is growing. And then you see this little thin lining the little hypo yeah. that's decidua, that's the uterine cavity. And then this next thick part is decidua paratellus. And this, is, this would be decidua capillaris. You see what I'm saying now? Uh -huh. So at yeah. this point, the embryo, it's growing, but there's a sp still a little bit of endometrial space left that it hasn't yeah. taken up yet. Yeah. Make sense? Yes? Yeah. Okay. So at one point, this will also be taken up. But this is called the double decidual sign. It shows that a pregnancy is growing normally at, for that time frame. I think this is like 4.5 weeks or something. Okay, next. Uh, from the side of decidual bacillus, it's going to grow and 
yolk sac, okay? So that's another sign of, so this is the yolk sac and this is the gestational sac, this is the uterus, so it's gonna grow in yolk sac, that's another sign of normal pregnancy. And then next, from the yolk sac, because you see the, the embryo, right? It has like one side that becomes, that embeds and becomes the tropoblast and has the yolk sac, the other side is the amnion, amniotic sac, right? Uh -huh. So the yolk sac and the amniotic sac, it's like two bubbles, but the amniotic sac keeps getting bigger and the yolk sac should start shrinking. So this is the amniotic sac. This is keep getting bigger. And this is what they call is the fetal pole, I believe. And at this point, when you see this, and then you see this right here, Kenny, this thin, another line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the amniotic membrane. And this entire thing is the chorionic membrane. Uh -huh. Okay. So at this point, no, you this... should, huh? No, this is like, damn it, I gotta learn all this shit. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the picture and I'll show it to you again. So no, 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 point, no, no, I'm good, I'm good. At this point, you should see like, you should hear a heartbeat. And that's another thing. I'm just gonna show uh -huh. it one more time. So this, I've, okay, so it's two sacs. This, would, this would, is gonna end up becoming the amniotic sac. And then uh -huh. you're gonna have another, the yolk sac. Uh -huh. Actually, look up another picture. A better one. You'll see what I'm talking about. Yeah. It starts off with two bubbles. The amniotic sac keeps getting bigger. The yolk sac keeps getting smaller. And then the amniotic sac has the fetus. Okay. okay. And then this is the corpus luteum. During pregnancy, you know how you have a corpus luteum that secretes progesterone that supports the pregnancy, right? Uh -huh. So what do you think these things are? Don't look at the little thing. Don't look at the little... Uh, Bottom. Uh, I guess that's those are follicles, and it's no. where in the ovary towards the, yeah, the cortex or medulla. Uh, I don't know. The cortex. follicles, the follicles that are kind of like towards the cortex. Isn't that the same like with the lymph nodes too? With the follicles mean? are more like. With lymph nodes, the follicles are usually towards the cortex. Oh, uh, yeah. You mean like the primary follicles and stuff? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, so, okay. So with ovaries, the follicles are just towards the cortex, and then the medulla has like the blood supply and whatnot. That's why you see them towards the borders. You good? Yeah. Okay. All right. So next... Uh, any questions, Kenny? Did I go through anything too fast? Anything too crazy? No. I think it's all right. Okay, yeah, so... I just haven't really learned the stuff yet, so... All right, and then if you're, if you're going to ask, like, what, what view this is, it's probably going to be a sagittal view because I see the... I see the... I think this is the external iliac vein. Like I said, it kind of goes lateral to it at one point. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't to worry about what view disease. And these are most likely all, except this is probably going to be a coronal view or transverse view because it's a short axis. But all these where you can see the entire longness of the uterus are going to be sagittal views. This is probably mm -hmm. short axis. So it's probably going to be a coronal view. This is ovaries. Okay. Abnormalities, like as you can see with the gestational sac, it's supposed to be usually, as all the pictures I've shown you, the gestational sac is pretty circular or elliptical, right? So if the gestational mm -hmm. sac looks all weird like this, so this is a subchorionic hemorrhage, as you can see, like this is the gestational sac and this like really hyperechoic beyond it. And you can be like, yeah. oh, what if that's the chorionic membrane? But look how thick this is, and it's not really symmetrical. Bunch of things, and then the gestational sac is not normal. Let's look at the other one. So you see how the chorionic membrane is pretty thin and symmetrical. Mm -hmm. But in this one, it's on this side, it's a lot wider. So this this is a subchorionic hemorrhage. So this this mm -hmm. is another one. 
this is the anechoic, just like as fluids. So this, sometimes blood, it depends on how, if there's pus in it or whatever's in it, it can be anechoic or hyperechoic. But this is more of a fluid also in, in the, this is a transabdominal sagittal view because you see the bladder in the front and the uterus in, behind it. So, mm -hmm. and the bladder is kind of full. And I can see the transducer coming from here. So some of these things you can probably diagnose with transabdominal. If you don't see anything, what you need to see in transabdominal, then you can do a transvaginal view. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next, this is a few things about ectopic pregnancies, right? So this right here is the uterus, right? As you can see. All right. And if, if you're like, oh, this looks like, how do you know that's uterus and how do you know that's ovary? Some of this you just have like recognized as you're scanning. So I wouldn't beat myself up too much about that. But basically this is the uterus right here. And there's something going on right here. So if you see, this is called a tubal ring. So if you see a hypochoic little cystic-like thing and then with the hyperchoic signal around it and sometimes you even see yolk sac i think there's like yolk sac here and even here too that's an ectopic pregnancy and if you see the if they mark the uterus on one side and then you see it there that's probably that next next region so the ovaries are more laterally towards the left here you get what i'm saying so yeah. this is like a common region, like as you as they said. I think it's the they say what the ampulla is some, in the next common region where topic pregnancy implantations happen. But the so but basically nine percent or something. Right? Yeah, right. So I mean, I don't know. sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Yeah. So if you if they're in that area, then it's probably. And if they give you a question like that, they'll probably mark the uterus or something. Yeah, they would have to, or if you see like something it, and then encapsulated here and then it's like connective tissue and it, it mm -hmm. where you can see like that organ ended and then you see a little, or if you see a gestational sac and you don't see a uterus surrounding it, then it's probably an ectopic pregnancy. And all. this is probably, like I said, the coronal view because that's the only way you're going to be able to see the ovaries and the uterus right and left to each other because in a sagittal view you just get a sagittal slice mm -hmm. okay so mm -hmm. once again it's showing uterus and a tubal ring and that next whole region uterus this is the ovary ovary is relatively hypochoic with some some like uh it's relatively hypochoic Okay. All right. So yeah, ovaries are relatively hypochoic. So if around that area, if you see a hypochoic area, and then another area that are that's more hyperechoic, and then between that you see a little cystic thing with a really hyperechoic rim, that's going to be a tubal ring, and that's probably an ectopic pregnancy being implanted there, and that's how you can tell. Also, like in a realistic case, if a patient comes in with five weeks, you know, six weeks pregnant, beta ACG is up, and you don't see a pregnancy in the uterus, and you, you don't even have to find where the ectopic pregnancy, you can, the, and the, the, you're getting beta ACG, you can say like, okay, this is an ectopic pregnancy because I don't see anything in the uterus. Okay. All right, Kenny, what do you... Let me think, let me think. Transvaginal? Yeah, and then long axis or short axis? Sag long axis is sagittal, short axis is coronal. Mm -hmm. Look for the endometrial. Long axis. Right, right, because why? Because the... I see the whole uterus. <laughs> yeah, good job, good job, good job. And then what did, what did I say this area was? Retro uterine pouch. Yeah. Pouch so with ectopic pregnancies, if it's in the peritoneum and there's peritonitis, you can see fluid accumulation there. And depending on how much fluid, sometimes it's normal to have a small amount of fluid there. But 
if it goes up to like two thirds of the uterus's height, then you can be like, oh, that's a large amount of, of fluid, along with the other signs of signs of ectopic pregnancy. Okay, like this one, right? This is the same thing. This is a transabdominal view. What what uh, plane do you think this is? I don't know. Oh wait, 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 wait. Yes, this is do. a what's that? Da, 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 da. What, what do you think this thing is? This is big. Sagittal. What do you think this I'm big saying, is? Yeah. It's what, the bladder. What? I just don't know what to call it. It's that thing where you're going the savage of you know? Yeah. What is this big anechoic sac? The bladder. Bladder, right? And yeah. with yeah. if you're doing a transabdominal ultrasound, you want the bladder full because it pushes the uterus back. You can put it up and you can see everything in nice profile and it gives some nice contrast. But if you're doing a transvaginal one, you want the bladder to be emptied and small because otherwise it's gonna mm -hmm. block. Because let me just show something real quick. Right here, right? So if the bladder is really big, I'm going especially for the sagittal, I'm going over the bladder's head, right? Sending mm -hmm. signals out. If this bladder is really big, it's gonna block a lot of that signal. Mm -hmm. But with transabdominal, you're gonna see a blue bladder full. Okay. All right, so basically what I was saying is like, you, this is, if this is the uterus, what is this area called? Once again, behind the uterus. Uh. Uh, pouch. Yeah, rectator mm -hmm. pouch, right? And if I say it's normal to have some fluid there, but because you see the fluid is going all the way to the top of the uterus, there's a lot of fluid. So what happened here is this this region right here, there was a cyst there, most like an ectopic pregnancy that burst. You see this wall? Mm -hmm. This is the bladder, but you can see then another border right here, which burst, which yeah. caused peritonitis, and then which caused fluid accumulation. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, so this this is the so in the even within the uterus, the it has to be implanted in a certain area. You know what the corneal corneal region of the uterus is? Corneal region. The corneal uterus? region. Yeah. Uh. -uh. What's that? So you know how the uterus is like a fundus, right? Yeah. So if you like thought of as like a head think of where like the ears would be you get what i'm saying like the corners where the <laughs> the isthmus connects uh -huh. yeah so those are the uh -huh. regions so if those areas are really like like sometimes they call it bicorneate uterus like if they're really pronounced they they're if there's a implantation there yeah it's called bicorneate it kind of looks like a bull's horn like instead of having a normal fundus and round shape it just looks like there's like a narrowed area in the middle and two really pronounced like. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. so with those kinds of uterus that have a high tendency to have ectopic pregnancies. So with the, if you have an implantation there, that's also not normal. And that's an also an uh, ectopic pregnancy. Uh -huh. okay. okay, that's all with the pelvis i mean first trimester any questions what you think uh, no you sure you're probably I just thinking think about it. the whole the sex right and the different layers i don't know what <laughs> um i don't know I, don't, I didn't i feel like i didn't have enough time to review this stuff yet so right now i don't have any questions okay sorry okay all right, so with testes, it's pretty easy. It's super easy, like testicular ultrasound is easy. All right, so basically, you know, just anatomy. Um, so you have the lobes. Where's the red, red tit testes at, Kenny? Which area is the red tit? Yes. Oh, red tit testes. <laughs> um, I don't know, it's gotta be someone closer to the epididymis, I think. This right here. Yeah, that area. That's the red testes, okay. And this is the, where's the, this is the afferent, the ductus afferens, and then ductus deferens, and this is the epididymis. So you have ductus afferens, and then epididymis, and then ductus deferens. Got it? Okay. So 
this is the Reddit test. So Reddit test, these are going to be mostly anechoic and you're going to see like basically what you think you would see. It would be like an area with a lot of anechoic dots. There, let's see. So with test testes, there's two views. There's a long axis view and a short axis view. Long axis views are taken like this. Short axis views are taken like this. Cool? So if the testes looks more circular, it's a short axis view. If it looks long, kind of like an egg, it's a long axis view. Cool? All right, so the epididymis, right? So the, normally the epididymis is like, I know it shows like posterior, and more, it's like posterior and kind of lateral to the testes. And it has a superior portion, and this is the tail, this is the head. The superior portion on a ultrasound kind of looks like a pyramid. So on a long axis view, you can mostly see the epididymis only on the top, but on a short axis view, like, okay. So on a long axis like this, you can usually pick it up on the top, but on a short axis, sometimes you can see it on the posterior side because you get what I'm saying, right, Kenny? Cause it's on the, like it's, it's behind here. So long axis is like this yes. way, right? So you, you're gonna yes. see it on the top, most likely if I put the transducer like this way. And if I do put the transducer in a transverse way, you're gonna see it on the posterior side. Yeah. So this is a long axis view. And like I said, the epididymis kind of looks like a pyramid on top. It kind of looks heterogeneous. Like it's not, it's not in like the testes where it looks like the same homogeneous. Kind of looks heterogeneous with sl slight variable eco texture, basically. Okay. Uh -huh. But look at the just size. It's not supposed to be too big compared to the testes. So that's the epididymis. So in an epididymis, um, Epididymiditis, epididymiditis. I'll show you, like, it's gonna be a lot more bigger. Okay. And then this is a short axis view. You see how it looks more sir, compared to two? This one looks long, looks long right? Epididymis yeah. on top, capsule underneath, because you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then short axis view, the capsule on the bottom. So if, the, if there was an epididymis, you might see it here on the posterior mm -hmm. side. But on the long axis, you kind of like going this way from this side. So the epididymis, you only pick it up on the top. Okay, so this is the testes. Once again, this is the epididymis. You see how it looks kind of like a pyramid? Yeah. Right? Okay, so now look at epididymitis. Look, this is, you see how big it looks compared to the testes? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, so, and I know it says kind of, it kind of looks like has a heterogeneous texture to it, but just know to what extent, like this is really, really like variable eco texture. This, uh, this, like it's, it's heterogeneous, but not so, to such a major degree. But look at the size, it's really big, right? Yeah. Yes, you see it? your size but to me like looks just as heterogeneous but i don't know yeah, yeah. actually i'm not bigger. gonna lie to you bro like like as far as like how heterogeneous it's kind of hard to detect so you yeah, not that's the that. but but you you do appreciate the size right it's much bigger yeah, i mean fairly larger yeah this is that is look how small it is compared to the testes look how big it is compared to the testes so that's just just appreciate that okay and then in the testes blood flow come like you use doppler a lot so you have the testicular artery and vein and if you use power doppler you can see like the arterial pattern like the how much power the blood is flowing through so in the testicular torsion uh, you don't have the arteries arteries are not able to have that good pulsatile flow so sometimes arteries look like arter arterial flow kind of look like venous flow so if you go in there and you identify both arterial and venous flow with power doppler and then you see that the arterial flow is decreased it can you can like think okay this might be a testicular torsion because the testicular torsion like the spermatic cord gets wrapped around and the test the testicular artery doesn't have good flow okay this is normal flow all right all right so so in this one they're just saying just so if they give you this deal in the test they're not gonna say okay 
what's going on. They're probably going to give you a normal testes where there's like, they're going to show what normal flow looks like. And then if you see like a testes with no flow, you can think of like poss a possible diagnosis could be testicular torsion, depending on other things. Also, you would have probably mm -hmm. a negative cremastic, cremasteric yeah. reflex. Not, so you, yeah. you're not going to have that. So with those two combined, you can say a testicular torsion, but sometimes even with, if the testicular, if there's a lot of testicular inflammation and the testicles get really swollen, that can also impede blood flow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a short axis, looks smaller. This is the capsule. If you see the epididymis, it's probably around here. It's like the posterior mm -hmm. personal test. Okay, so they're, they're saying this is a epididymitis because this is it. So let's see. I need to squeeze. Okay, so this is a short axis view. Right. And like, remember how I said in a short axis, the epididym is going to be like uh, yeah, the back. To it in the back. So, yeah, so if you look at it, for so if they show you this, you for you to see, because there's normal blood flow in the epididymis, you just have to know like how much blood flow there is normally to appreciate if there's increased vascularity. Basically, yeah. that's what I'm saying. So, And then this is a testicle. So remember how I said the testicle has a pretty nice homogeneous eco-texture, right? Mm -hmm. So if you see something like this, where the testicles has very heterogeneous texture, at that, and then if you see, for example, there's uh, even the epididymis is swollen. So the epididymitis, if not left untreated, can progress to inflammation of the testicular and the infection can spread to the testicles. So, if the, so if at that point, even the testicles will have heterogeneous ecotexture. Mm, that's not good. That's not good at all. All right, oh, Kenny. Man, so man. How do you think we did, man? I think that's it. That's it? Yeah. All right, mm -hmm. I know I went through it fast, but... Uh, like, uh, I didn't want to get too into it. I just wanted to give you, like, the down and dirty of it all. Just because, you know, you guys are <laughs> fans or whatever. You don't need to be, like, expert on this today. So, uh -huh. so. all right, everybody. Peace. Later. Later. All right, let me stop this. We did it, man. We did it.